said one, the Lord, who fully attained perfect enlightenment. So akato yena bhagavata dhammo. To the teaching which he expounded so well. Supatipano yasa bhagavato samaka sango. And to the blessed one's disciples who have practiced well. Tamayang bhagavan tang sadama sasangang. To these the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, Imehisakarehiyata Rahang Aropitehiyavipujayama. We render with offerings our rightful homage. Sadhu no pande bhagava suchira parini putopi. It is well for us that the Blessed One, having attained liberation, Achima janatanukamba manasa. Still had compassion for later generations. Ime sakare dukhatapana karabhute patikanhadu. May these simple offerings be accepted. Amha kandi garatang hitaya sukhaya For our long-lasting benefit and for the happiness it gives us Arahang sama sambudo bhagava The Lord, the perfectly enlightened and blessed one Buddhang Bhagavan Tang Avivademi. I render homage to the Buddha, the Blessed One. Sakato Bhagavata Dhammo. The teaching so completely explained by him. Dhammang namasami, I bow to the Dhamma. <laughs> Supatipanno bhagavato sāvaka sango, the blessed one's disciples who have practiced well, sangang namami, I bow to the Sangha. Anamayang Buddhasa Bhagavato Pubhava Kanama Karanga Roma Sein. Now let us pay preliminary homage to the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Homage to the Blessed, Noble, and Perfectly Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed, Noble, and Perfectly Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed, Noble, and Perfectly Enlightened One. Anamayang Buddha Bidutinga Roma say. Now let us chant in praise of the Buddha. Yo so 
Tathagato Araha Sama Sambudo Tathagata is the pure one, the perfectly enlightened one, Uicha Charana Sampano. He is impeccable in conduct and understanding. Sugato, the accomplished one. Loka Vidu, the knower of the worlds. Anuttaro Purisadamasarati. He trains perfectly those who wish to be trained. Sata Deva Manusanang. He is teacher of gods and humans. Buddha Magawa, he is awake and holy. Yawi Mang Lokang Sate Wakang Samarakang Sabramakang. In this world with its gods, demons, and kind spirits, Sasamanavramaning Pachang Sate Manu Sang Sayang Abhinya Sajikatava Pavedesi Its seekers and sages, celestial and human beings, he has by deep insight revealed the truth. Yautama dese siyadi kalayanang maje kalayanang pariyosana kalayanang He has pointed out the Dhamma, beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, beautiful in the end. Satan sabiyanjana kevala paripunang parisudang brahmachariyang pakasesi. He has explained the spiritual life of complete purity in its essence and conventions. Tamahang bhagavan tangabi pujayami tamahang bhagavan tang sirasanamami. Chant my praise to the Blessed One. I bow my head to the Blessed One. Andamayang Dhamma Bhituting Aroma Se. Now let us chant in praise of the Dhamma. Yo so Savakato Bhagavata Dhammo. The Dhamma is well expounded by the Blessed One. Sanditiko apparent here and now, akaliko timeless, ehipasiko encouraging investigation, opanaiko leading inwards, bachatang veditabo in you he. To be experienced individually by the wise. Tamahang damang abibu jayami tamahang damang sirasanamami. I chant my praise to this teaching. I bow my head to this truth. Namayang Sangha Bhituting Aroma Se. Now let us chant in praise of the Sangha. Yo so Supati Pano Bhagavato Savaka Sango. They are the Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well. Ujjupati Pano Bhagavato Savaka Sango, who have practiced directly. Nyaya Pati Pano Bhagavato Savaka Sango, 
who have practiced insightfully, Sami Chipati Pano Bhagavato Savaka Sango, those who practice with integrity, Yadita Chatari Purisayukani Yata Purisambugala, that is the four fans, the eight kinds of noble beings. E Sabhagavato Savaka Sango. These are the Blessed One's disciples. Ahunayo, such ones are worthy of gifts. Pahunayo, worthy of hospitality. Dakinayo, worthy of offerings. Anjali Karaniyo, Worthy of respect, Anuttarang Punya Ketang Lokatsa. They give occasion for incomparable goodness to arise in the world. Tamahang Sangang Abipu Chayami Tamahang Sangang Sirasa Namami. I chant my praise to this Sangha. I bow my head to this Sangha.
So uh, practicing, for example, this morning, the, <clears throat> you know, we form opinions about how, what we should do first or practice. So be aware of this, you know, the, the doubt that arises or in your mind about what, should I start with the body, with the breath, sound of silence, <laughs> whatever it is. Be, uh, you know, trust yourself to be aware of, of uh, how one hears teachings and, and then gets caught in doubt about them or about what to do. Because this attachment to thought tends to put us into the dualistic structure, kind of absolutizing the relative. <clears throat> so, you know, like samatha cancels out vipassana or uh, vice versa. Or you, you take sides with uh, samadhi and then mindfulness. Or should you have mindfulness and then samadhi? And, and then it goes on and on, you know, this is a thinking process. This dualism is, it, it's, um, it's the nature of thought. And that's why I keep emphasizing being the knower of thinking rather than the thinker. Because you can hear, you can listen to your thinking process. And therefore it's, it's always... You know, it's a critical function. It, it, it's, it, it's, you know, its, its nature is to compare. Heaven, hell, this is the better than that. This is worse. This is bigger, smaller. These are, these are discriminations. And these are, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just a, a necessary function, useful function, but as a grasping of it, a blind, ignorant grasping of thinking, views, opinions, ideas, ideals, then we, we are caught in this realm of samsara, this, this uh, uncertain, insecure, doubting realm that we want, we, we want to find security in the insecure. So of course that's an impossibility, isn't it? To recognize insecurity like this but to, is, is wisdom, but to seek security in what is that which is very nature is insecure is ignorance. So when you're seeking security uh, permanent security, safety in the body is going to disappoint you. Uh, in another person, you want to find the right person that will never betray you, never let you down, support you under all conditions, and that will live longer than you do, so. <laughs> and have lots of money, maybe. <laughs> But this is, this is uh, looking for the, another person, another person's karma, another person's body. These are changing conditions. You can't demand that, they, they, that someone else be here just to make me feel secure. Or in conventions, teachers, religion, governments, notice how religions that promise, that tell you what's right and wrong, define everything, you know, but fundamentalist type of religion where you're very, you know, you're told all the time what's, what's a sin and what isn't, how you should live and and that there's a certain security that that one gets from putting one's trust in in uh, 
somebody else's views or religious doctrines. Uh, we, we don't trust ourselves, so we tend to want to find somebody or something or some religion, convention, guru that will tell us. And uh, we'll go along with that because we find it makes us feel secure. So you find like people following gurus that are very confident and very, you know, very sure about what's right and what what's wrong and how you should live your life. And you know, some of them are madmen, but they still have followings <laughs> because human beings. We're we you know we we don't know who we are and we don't trust ourselves, so we're looking for security. And somebody that's very confident, when you're not very confident, is very impressive. You know, I can trust this. He, he, he or she knows what they're doing. I don't, so I will do what they, they tell me to do. So it's like seeking the security in the insecure. So in this reflective style, you know, get, uh, you know, learning to reflect on the thinking process, you know, observe. Thinking is like this, and then uh, I've been encouraging this intentional, deliberate thinking. So you, it's not just accidental, or you're not grasping the idea of watching thinking, but you know, it's quite simple, you know, you just intentionally think whatever you want to think, but be the observer, the, the one that's knowing, thinking is like this, I am a good person, I am not a good person, is like this. This sense of me and mine, these, these uh, pronouns in English are very strong, you know, they what about me? And it's emphasized, you know, when you're feeling left out or, or not uh, appreciated. Think, what about me? And they emphasize me is, uh, is an assertion of, of uh, Sakya Ditti, self. My view, my opinion, what I think, if you want to know what I think, if you want me to tell you what you should do, I think you should. <laughs> so you notice how the, in the English language, even the emphasis in me and what I, this is mine, my view, is uh, it always gets this kind of special emphasis. So, me, mine, I, these are personal pronouns, but they're, 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 it's English grammar, and you can hear yourself thinking. You know, when you're in this feeling left out, you think, what about me? You can hear yourself thinking that. I can, anyway. Uh, maybe you can't. <laughs> So this, that which is aware of thinking. <clears throat> so we put that in the, in the using this word puto as a, as a reminder, not as an identity, not as just another sakyaditi identity or thought, but as a, 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 a skillful means to remind, be this puto, not this person that's thinking, well, what about me? You're, you're aware of that as a thought. And you, you're looking at, not criticizing it, but, but observing. So that which observes the thought is not a thought. 
And in order to, for Sakyaditi to take you over, you have to attach to your thinking process blindly. You know, I, what about me? And really believe that this what about me and operate from that and be committed to feeling uh, unappreciated because you weren't consulted in the decision-making process. And so you could carry that around for days or weeks on end. You know, bitterness, resentment, because you didn't consult me when you made that decision. And my view is very important it's very necessary. Otherwise, you know, I'm going to leave this community and, you know, you kind of emotionally blackmail them. If you don't consult me and don't respect me, I'm leaving. Is, this is, I think we all have feelings of this nature. <clears throat> so, so, but be the knower, the important thing is, you know, there is good taste, good manners, uh, you know, sensitivity, but, but that's not going to, that's not, you're not going to find security in it. You're not going to be liberated through being sensitive and feeling you always have to, you know, be, assert yourself and be somebody. And you have to be respected in order to, you have to be acknowledged as as an important member, or appreciated, or whatever, this, this is Sakya Ditti. So this, this awareness of this is not Sakya Ditti. And so this is, you know, this awareness, this puto is not not like you did. It's a it's a use of a word, a perception, a thought, a convention as a reminder. So it's not a grasping of it. I'm not saying I'm the Buddha. I am the puto, and Buddha is mine. My Buddha. Buddha is me. <laughs> I become the Buddha. That's the Kaditi. But but Bhutto is is a, like a reminder. Reminds you, oh yes. Be this rather than this person whose feelings are hurt because you weren't uh, respected properly. So that this way you you begin to notice uh, how how we do suffer, create endless problems uh, and and dukkha around uh, because of this ignorance. And and the sangsara and being attached, blindly, ignorantly attached to the conditions, not knowing any way out of it, and having no perspective on it, but just you know, trying to to uh, survive on the Sakya Ditti, on the ego level. Protect yourself uh, at all costs. So it's uh, trying to demand security from the insecure. You see, well, you can't, that's ridiculous, isn't it, when you really contemplate it? You can't ask things that are changing to not change, when there's natures to change. <clears throat> so this is where like awakening, panya or wisdom is observing the way things are. Buddha knowing the Dhamma, all conditions are impermanent and not self. So even this sense of me, you, what, a, what about me? is this sense of me is not self. It is English grammar, it's a thought in the mind, it's an emotion, it arises uh, under certain conditions, it ceases. 
So then you, you, you're reflecting on it, you're, you're understanding Dhamma, rather than trying to create security out of the insecure, which you'll never succeed at. It's an impossibility. So the ultimate security is in awareness, the deathless, So the third better doubt, which is kicha, is a result of attachment to thinking. And then doubt itself is useful, like uh, I think, the, like Zen koans and and the who am I practices. This is like developing the doubt as a skillful means. So that you're, you're not trying to conquer doubt, but doubt, if you, you know, when you, when you use, say, a koan or a question like, who am I? It's a, you know, it's a thought or a word, but it, it leaves your, your mind in a state of, uh, of suspension. The thinking process stops. Non pluses your thinking. Suddenly, who am I? And then there's there's a gap there. You know, the, before you start trying to answer the question, you don't. You're really not interested in the answer. You know, I'm Ajahn Sumato, and you know all that already. But the, uh, you know, but. It's, a, it's like a skillful means to begin to consciously recognize the gap between thoughts. <clears throat> or just in deliberate thinking, you say, I, you know, so you intentionally, you determine to intentionally think, but you're listening, and you're not particularly interested in the, in the thought, but in the gaps between the words. So consciously you're noticing before you think I is this. You're aware that you haven't thought I yet. And then you intentionally think I. And there's a gap. <laughs> it's very simple, isn't it? It's so obvious. But you know, the language itself, one word goes on to the next. You know, we don't notice the gaps between the words or the, the uh, non-plussing of the thinking mind after a question. When you're struggling, when you don't know the answer, you, you're uncertain, doubting. What should I do next? And then you don't notice, you're not conscious of that space where the thinking mind is not operative. So this is one this is a skillful means of being aware of connecting more consciously and, and mindfully on the process of how, you know, the background is this, the space and the words come like a, a thinking, a kind of neutral thought. <clears throat> you know, I am a human being, is, say, doesn't arouse strong feeling. Is a kind of matter of fact, uninteresting thought. So it's, it, you know, then use something like that just to experiment so you're not having to deal with, with uh, thoughts or words or perceptions that arouse strong feeling. But this is a way of investigating just the thinking process. And so you're this, like consciousness 
if you, uh, you, you know, we, we tend to experience consciousness through conditions. We're not aware or really conscious of something that we have no perception for. And it's interesting, they have this uh, Tate Modern Gallery in London, and so it's the, the Tate Gallery, but it's all modern art, and so the, you go into the Tate Modern and there, there's all kinds of crazy art forms. And it's just interesting to watch people in this art gallery. And some of them get really frustrated. <laughs> By, you know, the, the, uh, what is passing from modern sculpture or, you know, abstract art or whatever. If, it, if they have no way of perceiving it other than, the, what does it mean, you know? And so a lot of the paintings that are called untitled, and that's even more frustrating. <laughs> and say, sunset over Venice, even though it doesn't look anything like it, at least you can kind of squint your eyes and make it <laughs> <laughs> or one, they had one where a, a, a grand piano was uh, hung upside down from the ceiling. <laughs> now, if you think, you know, that you want art to be sensible and that then, <laughs> that's a ridiculous thing to do, to hang a grand piano upside down from the ceiling. But, <laughs> but I'm more interested in, in, in how it affects the mind, because, you know, we, we want the certainty, grand piano doesn't belong on the ceiling. <laughs> You know, it should be on the floor, and then, then it's all right. I feel all right about that. But then it's hanging from the ceiling. That's totally out of context. It's silly. It's uh, not natural. It's, and so we, we feel critical or threatened by conditions that don't make sense. So, you know, like, like you find, like xenophobia or racism or fear of foreigners and things like this are all around, you know, wanting security from what you know, what you feel safe with, like your own group, your own ethnic group. Like in England, for example, to, to be with real Englishness <laughs> and, and you get all these foreigners coming into the country and now they European Union has expanded, so all these Romanians, there, Eastern Europeans, <laughs> these foreigners, you don't know what they'll do next. <laughs> so there's a tendency to want to, to just hide away in, in Englishness and in, in kind of, because that you feel secure with. Some idea or view of limitation, ethnic identity, <clears throat> that, that, because a foreigner, you don't quite know what they'll do. If you're very, you know, if your safety depends on the certitude of a cultural, common cultural assumptions, manners, etiquette, forms that, that reaffirm this sense of Everything is all right because, and we've got to protect us from these uh, invading aliens. <clears throat> so xenophobia is a problem. We that the modern, you know, now because everything's mixing up, like in Europe, everything's mixing now. You can't just have pure Englishness or anything else. It's it's uh, it's not. That's not possible. There's always been this mixing, migration, 
going on. But this is attachment to perception and the limitations we create and then the fears that come when these when our perceptual world is challenged and and we we you know we feel threatened or fear anger resentment kill it kill it off you know kill you know send the foreigners back to their own country <laughs> that kind of thing uh it's uh, it's is a way of, of, you know, the kind of redneck mentality or the idea of just protecting the known and what you treasure and feel safe with. So the awakening, you see, is not, you, you can begin to understand the fear that comes from, that, of attachment to fundamentalist opinions to views of orthodoxy or, uh, you know, safety and, and how things should be done and what's right and what's wrong. The moral dilemmas now, you know, about in medical science. You know, as... as medical science advances in around abortion and when is a fetus a human being or I mean there's so many at one time there was it was more certain because there was no way a fetus could if you know if it was born early too early there's no way you could keep it alive but now you can keep them alive uh, the hospital in London where the whole ward of of Premature babies, fetuses, are in incubators. You know, they're just like little rats, really. You know, with tubes going in, they can keep them going. When, when is it? When should you pull the plug out? <laughs> switch it off. Switch off the machine. You see, these are moral dilemmas around sexuality. In the the, the Bible says homosexuality is abomination. And then there is this, this question now, is it really? Or, you know, what is, is, is this to be grasped, this view? Or uh, is it to be questioned? So, you know, the, the kind of moral dilemmas that... So there's a tendency to want to <coughs> quote the Bible and say, the Bible says this, and so we must believe it. So notice how we get security, we might find our security in grasping our interpretation of, of the bi biblical teachings. So it is a time now where everything is challenged, you know, it's not you don't have the security of everybody agreeing on, on the same moral perceptions and whatnot. So you, you and, and this mixing of cultures and races. It all makes us feel, you know, it, it, it doesn't have the certitude that we had when, when traveling, like I go to Thailand every year that's easy. It's only eleven hour flight from London to Bangkok. <laughs> but, but like hundred years ago it, it was you know, Thailand was far away. <clears throat> but now it's not. Neither is any other place. Because of of uh, you know, the world has shrunk in terms of we, we the internet, the technology, air travel, and so forth. So that this changes our perceptions. And yet we can still be grasping perceptions that may have been appropriate a hundred years ago. So there's a lot of like ethnic demands, you know, Basque liberation and uh, 
all these, this kind of the way that what happened to Yugoslavia, everybody asserting their, their ethnicity at the expense of everyone else. Uh, so that this sense of, in, in Britain, Great Britain is, is getting smaller and smaller. You know, Scots are probably become independent and then the Welsh and there's even an independence movement in Cornwall and <laughs> And then I hear Yorkshire plans to... <laughs> Pretty soon England will only be Hertfordshire. <laughs> That's where I live. <laughs> but this is, you know, how the, the mind works. We experience life through perceiving. Now that is... You know, we're conditioned to perceive in certain ways. Cultural conditioning, tilapata baramasa. We perceive what's right and wrong. And, and it tends, to, you know, we're told, you know, like the Bible says this is right and that's wrong, then that's our, that's our standard that we operate from. So we grasp biblical teaching without knowing what we're doing or what it really means or whether it's appropriate now. If we think it's the word of God, then it can't be challenged. But when we see it in terms of Bibles, all holy books, all sacred works, all religious conventions are conventions. They begin and end. They aren't, you know, so, and even though we, we, we believe that the Bible is the word of God, that's another Convention, isn't it? That's a belief, a thought, something, a perception that we grasp and operate from. So this is a way of, of beginning to, to see, you know, from this wisdom level, what grasping condition phenomena, the result of grasping condition phenomena is like this. And so you'll always be, you'll never be quite certain. You'll have maybe develop a false certainty, but it's always a divisive thing, you know, like get rid of the foreigners or and you get rid of, you know, protect at the expense of uh, the others who you see as the enemy. <clears throat> So in the deathless, then the uh, that's non-judgmental. Not saying it doesn't tell you what's right and wrong, or how what you should do next, but it puts you in outside, you know, a transcendent or an embracing relationship to the conditions. So your relationship to the conditions is, is, is you know, your using of the conditioned world, the conventional world, is through wisdom rather than through habit, fear, ignorance. See, this is what liberation means. So then we have the discernment, and through that wise discernment, then we can respond to particular things. You know, we have a way of, of not just operating from a, a fixed view or opinion, but from the immediacy of, of the present, from, from understanding, from panya, from wisdom, rather than from ignorance. <coughs> so being, bringing, uh, encouraging you to pay attention to the thinking, your own thinking just to get to see how, 
one thought connects to another. And that's why thoughts move so quickly. And if you think about thinking, you're just caught in the trap. You know, thinking about anatta, thinking about nibbana, thinking about where you are, what you should do next, how you should practice. It, it, all this thinking and being without realizing the grasping of thought is like this. And learning, and so this, this reflecting on the thinking process, then you become more confident and able to use thought rather than just be habitually thinking, a victim of your own thoughts, thought habits. <clears throat> So in the present moment, there's a space. There's the, the thought rising, ceasing, the gap. Or all this leads towards the unconditioned, unborn, or the emptiness, or, you know, whatever you want, anatta, these words, these, uh, these words like anatta, nibbana, niroda, se- with uh, cessation. Um, unborn, uncreated, unconditioned. These are, these are words too, but they're, you know, they're, they're pers- they, you can't create a, a non-self as an image. Can you can't you can't create an anatta image. You can create an atta image, a self. You know, you can do a self portrait or whatever. But the but the but the anatta so it is a it is to to recognize, realize anatta is through mindfulness. This pure Conscious awareness is non personal, <coughs> non cultural, non is not doesn't depend on thoughts or conditions, but it's always here and now, it's the background, it's the what holds everything together. And then from this point, being this, then your relationship to the, your body uh, and your condition, your habits, your emotions, your memories are like this. You're, you see them in terms of what they are rather than being identified and limited by the, the habits you've acquired. So wichikicca, then doubt, is uh, the third fetter. So then, point out these three fetters are human-made fetters. The ne- after that, after stream entry, then there's still raga, or sexual desire, and batiga, uh, aversion. Now these are not human creations. These come with the human package. You know, so it's not cultural. These are aversion and sexual desire are not cultural. And they are what they are though. And how we relate to these then is cultural. You know, so we, you know, we have cultural attitudes about sexuality and and aversion you know we we have ideals about being kind and loving and you shouldn't hate or we have maybe more kind of prejudice you hate your enemy you know the enemy is bad you hate them and you kill them that's that's uh, you know a different cultural take but for most of us here we're probably more the kind that 
forgive your enemy is the ideal, you know. We should, because that's beautiful, isn't it? To be able to forgive your enemies is as an ideal, I think. You know, I quite like that. Go for it. But as a reality, you know, when somebody like the, the Anglican priest with her daughter, you know, she probably 100% for the ideal of forgiveness. But the reality of her emotional state in the present was not forgiving. It was anger and revengeful. You see, so that is then the conflict between your emotional, the realities of what your emotions are doing and the ideals that you hold about how things should be. So the neurotic inner conflicts that we have are, you know, usually the battle between your the idealism uh, uh, of reason and uh, and uh, the intellect with the emotional habits. You know, you hear people saying, "I," you know, people uh, wanting to be reasonable and rational about things, and then they break down into emotional weeping. And they say, "I'm so ashamed of myself. I'm just." so weak because I'm crying and weeping and I know this is silly, I'm just being silly and it goes on the battle between you know being emotional is silly, being you know very reasonable and cool is is praiseworthy. So that's the ideal, it would be reasonable, cool about things, not be emotional, not get caught up and make an emotional scene is is, uh, good manners and good behavior and praiseworthy. And then people that make emotional scenes, we can, or when we do it, we feel guilty or ashamed. So this is just to recognize that emotions, <clears throat> you know, they're not reasonable. But they're certainly, you know, how we feel life and how we experience things. So this awareness of emotion is not saying is, don't be silly, don't make a scene. But it's able to, to um, see the emotion, to receive emotion, no matter how, you know, no matter if it's mature, immature, whatever, you, whatever perception you, you want to label it, it's like this. And being reasonable also is seen as an object. It's not an end in itself. It's not to, that, that, that we have to become reasonable Buddhists. As a, as a goal, liberation is through being reasonable about everything. Being reasonable is, you don't feel anything when you're reasonable. <laughs> you know, you don't, if you want to write poetry, you can't be reasonable. <laughs> when you go to the Tate Modern in London, you know, reasonable people can't stand it. Because <laughs> being reasonable is ha- grand piano shouldn't be hanging from the ceiling. That's reasonable. <clears throat> Buddha, 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 Buddha,
Padmi. I render homage to the Buddha, the Blessed One. Sakato Bhagavata Dhammo The teaching so completely explained by him Dhammang Namasami I bow to the Dhamma Supati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sango the blessed one's disciples who have practiced well, Sangang Namami, I bow to the Sangam.